uh, wanted to start with a couple of uh, stories. You know, one of them is uh, of this uh, farmer called Ramakrishna from Anandapur district uh, in Andhra Pradesh. It is uh, one of the dry districts uh, in, uh, in Andhra Pradesh, the driest district of Andhra Pradesh. Uh, and, uh, you know, farmers have to depend on a lot of dry land crops uh, that they grow. Uh, and uh, they do face a challenging circumstances. And uh, uh, this Ramakrishna, he is a tenant farmer, so he doesn't have land of his own, but he's leasing land from other landowners and cultivating. And whatever uh, government systems, support systems exist uh, for farmers, uh, he doesn't have access to those, right? So he can't get a uh, bank loan. Uh, for growing his crops. Uh, he doesn't have access to crop insurance or disaster relief and uh, things like that. Uh, so, uh, as uh, he faced a couple of crop failures, uh, he went into very high debt and uh, decided that he should take his life. Uh, so, he describes how his mind was filled with tension and he feels that he's completely helpless, right? Uh, no, nobody is there to assist me in this kind of situation. And that is what pushed him to commit suicide, but uh, I mean to, to try to commit suicide, but uh, luckily his life was saved uh, by his fellow villagers and taken to a hospital and so on. And then one of his uh, partners, right, which works in the Anantapur area, uh, actually worked with them to kind of try to get the family back uh, you know, on their feet uh, by providing them with an alternative livelihood of a cow. And also, uh, you know, the wife of the farmer is now uh, becoming part of a women farmers cooperative. Uh, so they've actually formed a collective of uh, single women farmers who are landless, uh, trying to get uh, land on lease uh, collectively. Uh, because uh, when they're leasing in as a single uh, farmer, uh, they may have to pay a high lease rate and then they are, uh, uh, you know, they, they may be unable to manage uh, the whole agriculture operations. But if they are a collective, then they may be having a better chance. Uh, so she has also now become part of that uh, kind of collective which is ongoing. Uh, so these are some of the, I mean, just a glimpse of uh, some of the efforts that uh, uh, we and, uh, you know, other partner organizations in India are involved. Uh, like this is a, FPO is a farmer producer organization. Uh, REDS uh, has started a farmer producer organization uh, which primarily has women uh, farmer members. And uh, that's a very unique uh, initiative. In general, when we think about uh, farmers, uh, we always think about the man as the farmer and the woman as a farmer's wife or a farmer's daughter. Uh, but that is actually not true. Uh, majority of the work, about 70% of the work in farming is actually done by women. Uh, uh, so uh, women farmers getting organized and uh, uh, you know also having their recognition and their rights uh, is actually a very important initiative. So uh, this is one of the initiatives of uh, that's being supported by AIM. Uh, this is another uh, farmer, uh, her name is Kurva Manjula, this is from Telangana area, Vikarabad uh, district. Uh, so her husband, uh, Ravinder, uh, was also a tenant farmer who was uh, taking land on lease and cultivating. Uh, consecutive years, uh, you know, they faced uh, crop loss damage due to heavy rains and flooding, uh, but no assistance and no crop insurance and, uh, you know, any kind of a, uh, a measure, you know, which will help them handle that situation. Therefore, they also went into lakhs of rupees of debt. And on March 1st, 2021, uh, her husband actually committed suicide. Uh, and uh, since then, the family actually is in a worse state than what they were before, right? Uh, and uh, they didn't receive any kind of a compensation or benefit from the government. Actually, the government has a scheme, which also was introduced after a lot of pressure from civil society organizations, uh, that uh, if a farmer ends up committing suicide, due to debt or due to crop loss and so on. Uh, it is uh, something which is happening due to a systemic failure. It's not just an individual uh, uh, case. So therefore, uh, the government has a responsibility to help the family to get back on its feet. So there's a scheme under which the farmer family uh, is supposed to get 6 lakh rupees as an excretia uh, from the government. But even that is not available uh, to her because uh, her husband did not have her husband or she. Uh, don't have any land in their name. Uh, so this is one of the huge problems that uh, we are facing and we are also fighting you know, as our organization, uh, that most of the government schemes and benefits are limited uh, to farmers who own land and uh, who have a patta to the land. Uh, in this case, actually, uh, they do have a family land of about one and a half acres, 
which is shared by three people and the patta is in the uh, his mother's name uh, but uh, because the patta is not in his name he doesn't get a life insurance or uh, uh, you know compensation from the government so that's the kind of situation that they're facing and she is now continuing as a tenant farmer leasing land also working as agriculture worker she has three uh, children that she's taking care of uh, now as a single uh, woman uh, but uh, she has not lost hope uh, she in fact uh you know when we reached out to her as part of our work and part of our helpline uh she was ready to come and speak out about her issues and she basically says that um i don't want the same situation to happen to other uh, farmers uh so therefore the government should do uh, what it is supposed to do uh, you know what is the right of every farmer to get certain support systems from the government so she is ready to fight for that she's come to hyderabad she's speaking on etv she is uh, Uh, participating in a public hearing so recently just before i came here on september 12th we held a big public hearing in uh, hyderabad uh, where uh, there were a jury of eminent persons uh, there was justice sudarshan reddy who was a retired supreme court justice and uh, there was uh, mr gopal rao who was a retired ias officer who was a revenue secretary of andhra pradesh uh activists like yogendra yadav and uh, kavita kurugandi uh, so basically about uh, 150 tenant farmers uh this was focused on the issues of tenant farmers uh, farmers who are leasing land and cultivating whose numbers are growing enormously but they don't receive any kind of a support and recognition within the system uh and uh, farmers like kurwa manjula came and presented their case in front of the state level media and uh, this whole uh, thing once again highlighted the problem of uh, tenant farmers before the uh, entire state and uh, we also could find immediate impact because uh, as, uh, e- even uh we invited after the public hearing uh, the leaders of political parties also to come and state what they are going to do uh, for tenant farmers we found that two days later the president of the main opposition party in telangana actually issued an open letter to all the tenant farmers in the state saying that it is going to be their duty to uh, uh, recognize the tenant farmers and make sure that they get the support of all the uh, government systems which are in place in fact there is an act Uh, which exists in telangana uh, which requires the government every year to recognize uh, who are the cultivators who are cultivating on leased land the tenant farmers and issue them uh, identity cards uh, they are called dual and other benefits eligibility cards uh, to each of these farmers so based on an application and verification uh, but that entire act though it is still in force it's not being implemented by the government so like abhay was also saying the several things which actually exist to address the problems but even they are not being implemented they don't reach uh, you know the benefits don't reach the farmers so that is the kind of uh, fight that uh, many of us are also involved in so uh, i just want to say that when we imagine an, an indian farmer uh, it is uh, not a uh, you know somebody who is distressed and helpless uh, that we should imagine uh, actually farmers are people who are uh, extremely skilled in what they do and uh, with multiple kind of skills you know which i think uh, many of us here could be uh, uh, you know ill equipped <laughs> to basically do what the farmers of india do uh, they do enormous multitasking uh, they have expertise in about 30 different areas from being a soil scientist uh, to be able to identify the right kind of seed to be able to uh, uh, you know uh, predict weather uh right and the plan accordingly uh doing you know linear programming of 30 variables in their head to make various decisions uh right across the season and also marketing their produce and also managing their finances so this kind of a multitasking thing is what uh, indian farmers do and they are entrepreneurs who take risk every year to produce things and uh, they are producing things which everybody needs uh right food uh cotton for your clothes and uh, you know all the primary produce which is basically the basis of civilization right uh so uh, which uh, i think many of us cannot claim that what we produce are something that everybody in humanity needs but uh these people are not actually getting the enabling environment that is required uh, to actually make a sustainable livelihood and that is the problem that we are trying to uh, address Uh, so there are multiple challenges that a farmer uh, faces uh, they uh, need access to finance like any entrepreneur uh, 
uh, access, access to finance uh, so that they don't have to depend on high interest loans from private money lenders and fall into a debt trap. Uh, so uh, bank loans, when they have a natural calamity, some kind of an insurance or risk coverage, uh, and uh, uh, once they get the prop, being able to get a fair, fair price in the market, a functioning market rather than a market uh, failure, like it happens in uh, health. And also there is a inequality in land and access to resources. Uh, uh, basically, access to land is the biggest source of inequality in the world and certainly in an agrarian country like India. So when uh, some people in the village have 50 acres of land and a whole bunch of people have only 0 or 1 acre of land, that's a huge inequality and that kind of inequality cannot be set right over multiple generations, right? So that is where the role of the government comes uh, to make sure that the people who have less land but who are doing agriculture also have uh, access to all these uh, support systems. Uh, so uh, essentially what we are focusing on, I mean there are multiple dimensions to the work that we are doing, right? Like uh, let's say organizing women farmers into FPOs, providing some relief kind of a support and so on. Uh, but primarily what I want to focus is uh, the fact that uh, for farmers to uh, have a sustainable livelihood, there are a lot of public support systems which need to work. Uh, uh, like I said, you know, access to bank loans, uh, recognition of tenant farmers as uh, these land cultivars. There's an act in place, but it's not being implemented. Disaster relief, because uh, climate, uh, with climate change, actually almost every other year farmers are losing their crop due to no fault of theirs, right? They are doing the best uh, possible uh, methods and growing the best possible crops, but still, uh, they are, uh, uh, you know, they are facing crop uh, damage uh, and uh, fair markets and uh, move to sustainable agriculture. So these are the kind of public support systems that are the crit critical element in making uh, farming sustainable uh, as a livelihood. So how do you make these public support systems really work for the farmers uh, is the challenge that we are working on. So I'll just share uh, a few initiatives that we have taken up in that uh, direction just to give some glimpses. One of the things that we have started is uh, something called the Kisan Mitra Helpline. So it's a friend of a farmer. If you look at any of the cases of uh, farmers committing suicide or farmers who are in distress, uh, the feeling of helplessness that actually the system doesn't work for us, there's nobody in the system who cares uh, what is happening to me, is a deep sense of isolation right? that people uh, feel. And uh, uh, that is uh, something that we are trying to address by running a helpline. Uh, which we publicize even through the district administration that there is this kind of a helpline. So any problem that you have, you can actually call this helpline. So any farmer who has a problem with their land records or a problem with, uh, uh, you know, losing their crop due to a natural disaster or simply, uh, 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 you know, something that, uh, 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 that, that they are not able to get uh, access, let's say, to the local animal husbandry officer to uh, deal with their cow who has fallen sick. So any problem. Uh, that they face, they can call the helpline and we try to help them. Uh, so we, at one level, we provide uh, guidance on the phone itself that, you know, if you have this problem, then this is where you need to go, this is the step that you need to take. But we also have developed a network of field uh, volunteers, workers, uh, full-time field uh, workers, uh, who, uh, if the case is a little more complicated, then they actually go and visit the farmer and then uh, try to work out the issue and a lot of times it has to deal with once again the public support system. So uh, somebody in the Tassildar's office is not doing their job therefore uh, the, uh, you know uh, they are facing a problem or, uh, or the agriculture department. So we organize this cases department wise and then the local field workers go along with the farmer uh, to tackle that problem at the uh, official level. and. Uh, Generally, we try to uh, have a dialogue with the district administration, like the collector of the district, uh, to uh, have them on board, uh, right, for running this helpline. So while we are putting all the resources and training and the people who run the helpline, uh, when the collector also owns up uh, 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 this process, then what happens is that when local level officials don't do their job, uh, we bring it to the notice of the collector and the collector is able to actually put pressure. So they have a monthly review of all the pending cases of the Kisan Mitra uh, helpline and then they question, uh, you know, why are so many pending cases in this particular block uh, in the Tassildar office, right? So then the answerability and accountability in the system uh, increases. Uh, so that is the kind of mode in which we are working uh, with this helpline. Uh, it started in 2017, it's about six years now. and. Uh, uh, there are several cases where we've been able to help uh, farmers who call the helpline. This is one 
uh, individual case where uh, you know this person uh, was facing uh, uh, crop loss and then uh, was getting threatening notices from the cooperative bank that they will take over the land and so on. But after the Kisan Mitra intervention, we were able to work out with the uh, Scheduled Cash Corporation, which is, exists actually to help uh, Dalit farmers like this uh, to get a loan and then uh, get the cooperative bank to uh, have a settlement uh, so that they don't pressurize to take out their assets and so on. So these are the kind of interventions that we are able to make. Uh, about 15,000, uh, uh, more than 15,000 cases uh, we've been able to solve. Now I think it's about 16,000 uh, 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 cases we've handled through the helpline and about 70% of them we were able to resolve. Uh, and there are still several pending cases which have been followed up. Uh, and uh, in the last one year, for example, we uh, handled about 8,300 calls. And primarily this is working in about five districts in Telangana and uh, Andhra Pradesh. I mean, the good thing about this kind of approach is that uh, the people with problems come to us, uh, right? So there's an automatic self-selection that uh, the people with the really, uh, you know, more uh, uh, harder problems which they are not able to resolve by themselves, uh, they come to the notice of the helpline. So that uh, kind of alerts us to certain systemic failures also. So apart from solving all these individual cases, uh, the, uh, we also uh, identify certain systemic issues. So there are some things which can't even be solved at the collector level because some decision needs to be made at the state government uh, level. So uh, bridging that gap is one of the things that uh, the uh, helpline is uh, doing. So just as an overview, basically uh, AIDS approach in agriculture, we are uh, providing certain relief kind of a thing to farmers who are in distress. So that is one aspect. And then we are building better uh, uh, incomes and sustainability through this farmer producer organizations, uh, promoting millet cultivation and so on. Those are the local constructive efforts that we are doing. Uh, but the, the bigger thing I think which we are doing is making government work for the people, uh, for the farmers. And very similar to what uh, uh, you know the theme of work uh, that Sati is doing. Uh, ultimately, the public support systems need to be accountable and they need to work for the people. And where there are certain acts which exist, let's say the Disaster Relief Act, promises certain things to the farmers, uh, then that is the right of the farmer to get it. Right? It's not an optional thing that the government will do one year and they don't do it another year and so on. So a rights-based and accountability-based approach uh, is what uh, we are uh, taking so that we can address systemic level problems. Uh, so there are local constructive inter uh, interventions, but there are also systemic interventions uh, which can have a much larger uh, impact. Um, so, uh, okay. so this is one uh, example that I wanted to share about a larger systemic level uh, intervention. Uh, like in many of the cases, a couple of cases that we talked about, in fact all the three cases is that uh, farmers are facing uh, damage to crops due to uh, unreliable climatic conditions. It could be a drought in one year, it could be a hailstorm, it could be uh, heavy flooding and unseasonal rain. Suddenly in October, where you don't expect rainfall, like this uh, rain uh, happened on October 14th, right? That is the time when crop is just getting ready for harvesting. Normally you don't get monsoon rains in October, but the heaviest rain in 50 years happened in 2020 in, in Telangana in the month of October. And the government itself said that there are 25 lakh acres of crop uh, which got damaged in the state and they submitted an official report to the central government saying there's 8,633 crores of damage which happened. But when we demanded that uh, the, the government should come and uh, do an enumeration of which farmers uh, lost the crops and under disaster relief act they are entitled to compensation from the government, they did not even come to the villages to do a list of the farmers who are affected. So finally, after petitioning the collectors and the state government, we had to go to the High Court. And after several months, the High Court gave a landmark uh, judgment. So during through this uh, court process, we were able to actually expose that uh, the government had submitted official uh, reports to the uh, center that 15 lakh acres have suffered severe damage. And the center sanctioned, uh, instead of sanctioning 500 crores, which is what uh, is required, they only sanctioned 188 crores, okay, so without any explanation. But the state government did not even distribute that 188 crores to the affected farmers. And in the court, they were simply saying that, well, there was a lot of crop damage, but all the crop recovered. Uh, this is what they said officially in the court. So we had to expose all these things, and finally the government gave a land, uh, the High Court gave a landmark judgment uh, saying that it is a right of the farmers 
uh, to get this disaster relief. It's not something optional that the government can do or cannot do, may or may not do. Uh, so following that, uh, once again the same story repeats. Next year, again the uh, uh, Ifa government didn't intervene, again we went to the High Court. Uh, then the High Court uh, gave even more serious orders that independent of whether the state government or the agriculture minister or the chief minister issues an order, it is the duty of the district administration who are actually the officials uh, to automatically uh, do an enumeration of the crop laws and initiate the process of uh, giving the compensation to the affected uh, farmers. So in 2023, finally, uh, you know, there was another round of hailstorms and so on. Uh, the Telangana government finally accepted that it's our duty. So the CM himself uh, visited the affected areas. Of course, they also want to get some political, uh, you know, mileage out of it. So therefore, he visited and he declared that uh, we are going to give 10,000 rupees per acre as compensation to all the affected farmers. And for the very first time, uh, they also declared that uh, tenant farmers will also get this compensation. So because when he actually visited the villages, for nine years they didn't give a disaster relief. And for nine years they were denying the uh, duty of the government towards the tenant farmers. But then when, they, when he visited the villages, uh, he found that 50% of the agriculture is actually being done by the tenant farmers. So he declared that this uh, benefit should also go to the tenant farmers. So those are two major victories uh, that we got and about 405 crore rupees, so that's about 50 million dollars, was released uh, to the farmers, you know, through this uh, process. So this is a kind of a large impact that we can have when we do sustained uh, uh, advocacy work. So this is one example of an area, there's another example where we, uh, you know, the, the farmers were not getting a good price in the market for the chowar. Uh, the minimum support price was 2,600 rupees per quintal, but they were getting only 1200 and 1300 rupees per quintal. So they were making a loss on every quintal because their expenditure itself is about 2000 rupees per quintal, right? So they were getting only 1300 and actually the government is duty bound to intervene in such a situation. That is the meaning of having a support price. And that happens routinely even in the developed countries. Like in the US, uh, when uh, the price is below the target price uh, that is announced by the government, actually the government makes a cash payment to the farmers so that they because they know that the farmers need at least this much price to break even uh, so but that kind of system was not functioning in India so we once again uh, you know did a uh, uh, you know protest around that and went to the high court and the government ended up uh, purchasing about 4.5 lakh quintals of jowl uh, in that year so uh, there are several other examples of uh, uh, the advocacy work I think I'm running out of time so I will just uh, uh, conclude in two three uh, minutes. Uh, so this is uh, another issue which I already talked about of tenant farmers, um, uh, and uh, one of the things that we also do as part of our work uh, to build this accountability is uh, to do certain research uh, studies uh, because uh, a lot of times the government gets to even deny the existence of a problem. Uh, so, for example, they can say that. There are no farmer suicides happening in Telangana, which is what uh, the uh, Telangana government, uh, uh, you know, the ministers and all that have been officially saying. Whereas our documentation shows that every year there are about 600 to 700 farmers who are committing suicide. Since the formation of Telangana, about 8,000 farmers have committed suicide. So when we put out this documentation, which is well supported, then the media also covers it and the government cannot deny the existence of the problem. So, uh, similarly on the tenant farmers thing, we did an extensive study in Andhra Pradesh and also in Telangana covering uh, thousands of tenant farmers, the first time this kind of a study was done. Uh, so, we established that in Telangana, for example, 35.6% of the farmers are tenant farmers. Because we surveyed, uh, we did door-to-door -door survey of about 7,700 farmers uh, in 20 different districts uh, and found that 2,750 of them were tenant farmers. So uh, for the first time we were able to establish a figure uh, that about 35% of the farmers are tenant farmers. So now the government cannot deny. So they also started saying that okay, uh, there are tenant farmers who exist in the state. Now this figure is quoted in the assembly and uh, you know any discussions which happen in uh, on tenant uh, cultivation in uh, Telangana, uh, our study is what is actually the, become the authentic study. Uh, so now once we establish the facts on the ground, then you can uh, make a bigger push for a policy change. Uh, so doing studies, 
uh, filing uh, cases in the High Court if the government is not responding, running a Kisan Mitra helpline where if the administration is cooperative, then you can uh, solve problems through the helpline, right? And uh, doing public hearings which uh, uh, bring the uh, focus of the entire state uh, uh, media as well as the public, right? This is another public hearing which we did on farmer suicides. Uh, and which uh, established that, so we had 250 uh, farmer suicide families come and uh, do a public hearing in an open space uh, where they actually brought a photographs of their husbands or father who had committed suicide. So then nobody can deny that actually this problem exists in Telangana. Then the government is forced to do that. So within two weeks of this public hearing, they uh, sanctioned uh, ex gratia payment to 400 farmers, uh, farmer suicide families of 6 lakh rupees each. Uh, so these are the different kind of tools that we are trying to use to make the government accountable to uh, kind of get a systemic uh, intervention which goes much beyond uh, just uh, being able to address the problems of individual farmers or individual villages. Uh, so if we look at the scale of uh, the kind of impact, there's a huge multiplying factors. Though we are a very small team, some of whom are supported by it, some of whom are self-supported and so on. But we are able to make the bigger impact because we are using tools like this to get the system uh, to be uh, accountable. Just the farmer suicide families, for example, within a couple of years, we are able to get about $10 million uh, to be transferred uh, to the farmer suicide families from the government. Uh, so, so that kind of uh, I hope gives a glimpse of the, our approach and the kind of work that we are doing. And uh, uh, like Abhay was also saying, the help, support from aid actually plays a very key role in making these kind of things happen. Uh, because there are not many uh, organizations or funding agencies which uh, support this kind of uh, work which tries to put pressure on the system. Right. So, if you are uh, ready, if you want to run a school or a, uh, you know, or a healthcare uh, clinic in a few villages, it's more likely that you can actually get support for that. But if you are trying to do systemic change kind of work, which puts pressure on the system and which also becomes controversial uh, and uh, which also can, uh, you know, bring a pressure back from the government, you know, to try to make you stop doing your work. Uh, that kind of work uh, is actually supported only by a few organizations like AID. So that makes a lot of uh, difference. And uh, just wanted to put some figures out there of the kind of magnitude of, uh, you know, financial thing which is involved. For example, the Kisan Mitra helpline. Uh, we get about $40,000 of support from uh, various chapters of uh, AID towards the Kisan Mitra helpline. Now it is running in five districts if you want to uh, expand it to uh, 10 districts. Now for each new district, it takes about eight to ten thousand uh, dollars to expand into a new district because we need to get field workers there uh, who uh, uh, then follow up on the problems. Uh, uh, and uh, similarly, uh, if we are organizing these women farmer cooperatives, right, through the uh, in Anantapur district, uh, about two hundred dollars per month would uh, enable uh, uh, another field worker to uh, get organized in a different block of. Uh, so thank you once again, thanks for your support and making this kind of work possible. funds certain people like that, then does it help them and you and does it uh, help everybody? Is that is that something that you can see happening? Right. No, that's a very good question. So uh, our strong belief is that actually it doesn't have to be antagonistic. So and we don't go out of our way to make it antagonistic. So for example, the whole Kisan Mitra helpline thing, 
we are working hand in hand. In fact, it's a district collector uh, and uh, in a meeting with our organization that it was she who suggested, you know, that we should run this kind of helpline. Uh, and also when uh, we uh, encountered that crop loss uh, case uh, situation, uh, she took initiative to do the enumeration of farmers, but the state government was not releasing the money, so she suggested that we should file a case in the high court. Right? So I'm saying that people within the system who really care uh, about the uh, about the common people would also very much welcome and support this kind of work. So it doesn't have to be uh, antagonistic. So from our side, we try to make it synergistic. But it also is about the wisdom of the government, which is in power. So certain governments uh, have been much more welcoming and have this kind of a relationship with uh, uh, social activists or groups which are trying to uh, push for accountability. In fact, like uh, Abhay was saying, in, in Rajasthan, they, they actually brought out a Right to Health Act. Because once they bring an act, even if that government exists or any other government comes in the future, there are certain things that the people can go and demand, right? So in a democratic system, this kind of work, where we are trying to push for accountability and citizen activism is what uh, we are calling it, is a very essential thing and any good government should actually welcome citizen activism because it makes sure that their system works. So if their system works, maybe they'll get more votes in the future, right, in the next elections. If they're blind to that, uh, the gaps in the system, then they may be thinking that, okay, we've started all these great schemes, uh, but it's not reaching the right uh, amount of people. They'll get a good shock when the next election comes. It does happen, you know, once in a while. Uh, so I'm just saying that this is actually an essential part of democracy working, and uh, ideally it should be something which is welcomed by the system.